tonight is Shiva Subhatamas. The fast, of course, is only <clears throat> during the day. It's not really a Shiva Subhatamas. And uh, the Avelos, the morning of the three weeks, begins tonight. But Maisha Feinstein has a shuva where he rules that all the observances of the three weeks really begin the night before the fast of Shiva Subhatamas. It is Shiva Subhatamas. Now, luck of fasting, not eating, is only by day. But whatever observances begin with Shiva Subhatamas certainly begin the night before. So we should certainly reflect a little bit on the idea of Shiva Subhatamas and, of course, the three weeks leading to Tisha B'Av. Now, the Rambam writes that the reason we fast on the four fast days, Shiva Subhatamas, Tisha B'Av, Songadalya, Sarabhateves, is not simply to commemorate the terrible things, the terrible calamities that fell the Jewish people in those days. The reason we fast is part of the process of truth. Reflecting on the tsaris, on the suffering of the Jewish people, is meant to arouse us to truth. Because we're meant to recognize that all Jewish suffering is a consequence of Jewish sin. So because of the various things that were done back then and have not been rectified since, we still suffer the loss of the base of English. Now, Chazal tell us that any generation in which the base of English is not rebuilt should see itself as if it caused the Churban, meaning because if we would have been misaking, if we would have rectified the sins that caused the war, but we'd have the base of Megdash. If we don't have the base of Megdash, that means that we haven't fully repaired the damage. And therefore, by reflecting upon the Tsaris and their causes, we are meant to embark on the path of Chuba. So the fasting really is part of the process of Chuba. Of course, even before we are led to tshuva, there has to be an appreciation of the loss. In other words, if you lose something, we don't value it. Certainly reflecting upon the loss is not going to arouse the person to tshuva. And therefore, the character of these three weeks has a different aspect. Aside from the aspect of tshuva is the aspect of avelos, the aspect of mourning. Because mourning means you feel a sense of loss. When a person mourns for a loved one, that means that his sense of missing something, his sense of loss, expresses itself in certain observances. So this is a time, first of all, for our veils. We're meant to understand that the loss of the base of English, the loss of Eretz Yisrael, the loss of Jewish autonomy, the loss of Jewish unity, these are all things that are losses. And we should appreciate the fact that these are losses. That's why we observe rituals of mourning during this time. It's to impress upon us this sense of loss. That sense of loss already brings us to tshuva, which of course is the main thrust. If we do tshuva, then hopefully the consequence will be that the, all the things that we've lost will be restored. That's the basic idea of the three weeks. There is a very interesting question, which uh, we shine a mask. If you look in Parshas Nitzavim, Parshas Nitzavim is the parsha which follows the Techacha, the curses of Parshas Kisavo. And there we have a litany of curses. God warns us if we violate the Torah, this will happen, this will happen, all sorts of illnesses and afflictions, war, exile, you name it, it's there. And after that, it says like this, Vahaya, it will be, Ki elecha, olecha, kol when all these things before you, before you, all the things that were foretold in the Teichacha, then it says, you'll take it to heart. 
לכל הגויים אשר הדיחה לך השם עליך שמה, in all the nations into which you've been exiled, ושאבת עד השם עליך, and you will return to Hashem, you will repent, and you'll listen to his voice, ושב השם עליך, השבוסך, God will return your captives, ויחמך עליו compassion upon you, ושוב וקיבצך מכל העמים אשר יפיצך השם על מכך השם, והוא גאה לי from all the nations into which you were exiled. אם יהיה לי דחך בקצה השמיים, even if you've been exiled to the ends of the earth, משום מקבצך השם על מכך, from there God will gather you. והביאך השם על מכך אל הארץ אשר יש על מסך וירשתו, God will bring the land which your forefathers inherited and you shall inherit it. והיטיבך וירבך ומאבסך and you'll even be better off than your forefathers were. So this is a parsha which foretells the ultimate redemption. But it says that what will be the impetus to the tshuva that will bring the ultimate redemption when all the tsaras come to pass, you'll begin to think, you'll take them to heart, you'll think seriously, deeply, and you'll repent and the bonus law will bring the redemption. The question that Mishenim asks is like this, that we know there are many, many different things that can arouse us to tshuva. A person can be aroused to tshuva by learning Torah. A person learns Torah. He sees what he's meant to do, what his obligations are, and he does tshuva. A person can receive Musar, he can receive rebuke from another person. That can arouse a person to truth. A person approaching Rosh Hashanah is aroused to truth because he understands this is a time of judgment, everything is on the line. He becomes more serious, he repents. One of the causes of Chuva is when a person does Chuva because of Tsaras. He experiences suffering. He does tshuva. Rabbi Niona in the Shari Tshuva says that really this is a very, very deficient form of tshuva. Because if you come back to God simply because you've suffered and you want relief, so God has a very easy response. He can say that I don't need any foul weather friends. <laughs> because when everything is going well, you have no time for me. Now you're in trouble, so you come back. Says, that's not the uh, real tshuva. Says Yona, but you see from these psukim that the Kaddish Baruch Hu accepts that tshuva nevertheless. And even if the person does tshuva because he wants to find relief from his afflictions, the Kaddish Baruch Hu still accepts that tshuva. This is a chidush. This is an amazing thing. That the Kaddish Baruch Hu is so kind, so compassionate, he even accepts such a tshuva. But the question is, why is that the tshuva that will bring the ultimate redemption? I mean, wouldn't it be better if the tshuva that would bring Mashiach would be the altruistic type, where people simply start doing the right thing because they understand it's the right thing? Because why does the Torah tell us that what will be is that as we go through the tsaras, then we'll take them to heart, and then we'll repent. So it comes out that the tshuva that brings Mashiach should be an inferior type of tshuva. This is the question that we shine and ask. But the Ran says in Adrasha, no. But that's not the pshat and the psukim over here. That's not what the psukim mean. The psukim don't mean that we're going to experience the suffering and then to find relief we'll repent. It means something else entirely. We live lives in which we fool ourselves. There's a certain sense of uh, delusion, self-delusion. We convince ourselves that we can be successful if we have money, if we have brains, if we have uh, tact. And these are the things we need and uh, the things that will help us survive and thrive and be successful. And the truth is that the experience of Jewish history teaches us the opposite. We've tried to solve our problems with the money. 
And we've tried to solve our problems with strength, military strength. We've tried to solve our problems with diplomacy. Tact. Nothing has worked. And it's an amazing thing when you, uh, you think about it. You know, we're going into the three weeks. And uh, we know that these three weeks, the Haftaras, that we read the selections from the Novi, are selections which uh, which foretell churban, foretell destruction. But if we'd ask ourselves, when would we expect to read the worst prophecy of destruction? So it wouldn't be the first of the three weeks, it wouldn't be the second, it wouldn't even be the third. We'd expect the Haftarah of Kishabov should be the, the worst Haftarah, and it really is. It's, it's, it's awful. I don't mean awful in the sense that it's not well written. I mean awful in the sense that, that the calamities that it describes are so imaginably painful and bitter that it's just a, a shock to read. And if you look at that Aftara, what are the last words in that Aftara, the last verses? Like what is the conclusion? What is the punchline, so to speak, of that Aftara of Tisha B'av? It says, Kayam HaRashem, so says the Lord, Al Yishalel Chacham B'Chachmasa, let the wise man not praise himself with his wisdom. Val Yishalel HaGibor B'Gvurasa, and let the strong person not praise himself with his strength. And let the rich person not praise himself with his wealth. In other words, the lesson we're meant to extract from reflecting upon all the tsaras, all the troubles, all the tribulations of the three weeks and Khurban and Golos is to come to this conclusion. As we tend to think, that we can solve our problems with money. We can solve our problems with strength, military strength, physical strength. We can solve our problems with wisdom, tact, diplomacy. So therefore, the wise man says, I have what it takes to solve the problem. And the strong man says, I have what it takes to solve the problems. And the rich person says, I have what it takes to solve the problems. So the Navi says, let the wise person not praise himself, and not the strong person, and not the rich person. Only in this may a person praise himself, the extent to which he knows God. Lives by his word. That's something which is praiseworthy. Nothing else works. And that is the lesson, that is the final lesson after all the calamities and all the exiles and all the pogroms and all the persecutions, this is what we're meant to extract, that we are fooling ourselves if we think that wealth, wisdom, strength is going to solve our problems. Only the Bidon Shleilam can solve our problems, and the Bidon Shleilam will only solve our problems if we live by his word. That is the bottom line. That's the lesson. But we live in a fantasy world, in a dream world, where we delude ourselves into thinking that uh, there are economic solutions and there are military solutions and there are diplomatic solutions. That's our fantasy world. And the Hebrew world, word for that is dimyon. Dimyon means fantasy, illusion. We live in an oilam ha We live in a world of illusion. What shatters the illusion? when we reflect upon the entire course of Jewish history, we realize that all our assumptions, all our fantasies, are not true. And that's what the Pesach really means, says the Ram. It doesn't mean that we're going to experience the Tsaras and to find relief, we will repent. That wouldn't be so sincere, and that wouldn't be the ideal repentance. That's not what the Pesach can mean. The Pesach can mean that when we go through the entire course of history, and not only the curses, the blessings as well, and we realize that the blessings didn't come through our tact, intelligence, strength. And the curses weren't prevented by our tact, 
strength, etc. We'll understand that God runs the world. When we understand God runs the world, then we'll repent. Meaning that the Geula will come when our illusions are shattered by an analysis of Jewish history. When we finally get it, we finally figure out what Jewish history is all about, then our illusions will be shattered, then the rule will come. And that really is what we are meant to reflect on. That's what the most important lesson, I believe, of this period of time is. When we think about Jewish history, and again, Golos and Churban and loss, <coughs> suffering, if we learn this lesson, then we are one step closer to Buddha. It's very, very interesting that there's a tremendous remez, tremendous hint to this idea in this week's parsha. The, the Ishbitzer, the Neashi Layach, says an amazing thing. This week's parsha, there is a, a lengthy description of a war that's waged against the nation of Midian. And it's interesting, the Torah devotes more attention to this war than any other war that's described in Chumash. The war against Amalek doesn't get as much attention. The war against Sichon and Og doesn't get that much attention. This war against Midian receives an inordinate amount of attention. Of course, it's a war of retaliation for what the nation of Midian did to us. The nation of Midian tried to weaken us morally by sending their daughters out to seduce Jewish men to illicit relationships and ultimately to idolatry, the idolatry of Baal Poor. And Chazal tell us that Godel Hamachti Yosem in the heart, a person who causes another to sin is worse than a person who commits murder. And therefore, there is a war that's waged against Midian to take Nekoma, to stand up for God's honor in this area. There's a very interesting thing that God tells Moshe Rabbeinu before this war. He says, wage this war, achar te'asef elamecha, and after this you will die. Meaning this war against Midian is meant to be Moshe Rabbeinu's last official act. Because after that, Moshe Rabbeinu's mission is complete. Moshe will pass on, hand the baton to Yoshua. So this is it. Now, Kodesh Baruch didn't tell Moshe Rabbeinu exactly when to do it. He didn't say, do it tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. He didn't say, do it to the afternoon. He didn't say it had to be that week. Moshe Rabbeinu could have delayed, could have stalled. He could have said, okay, we have to gather a committee and plan and do a study, <laughs> you know, take a few months. It says that Moshe Rabbeinu did it the next day. And Rashi makes the point that even though Moshe Rabbeinu knew that his death was going to follow this war, he did not delay. And of course, this uh, demonstrates something which was very special about Moshe Rabbeinu, that he was inspired to do the word of God, even though the consequence for him personally would be very, very great. But this is what it says, wage war against Midian, and then you will die. Achar tiyasef hanach, and you will die. So the Ishbitzer says in this pasuk that there's a very, very deep remnant, a very deep hint, which is uh, alluded to here. Moshe Rabbeinu, al pi Kabbalah, is associated, in the mystical tradition, is associated with the concept of Das the concept of wisdom. And, of course, you don't have to be a mystic to figure that out. In other words, everything we know, everything we know as Jews came to us through the pipeline of Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? He was the conduit through whom we received the Torah. So therefore, any understanding, wisdom, intelligence, all comes through Moshe Rabbeinu. So Moshe Rabbeinu is associated with, with true wisdom clear wisdom, seeing things as they truly are. Says the Ishbitzer, Midian is associated with the idea of dimyon, of illusion. Now, of 
course, you think about it for a second, of course, that's the way it is. In other words, if what Midian does is to seduce the Jewish men to elicit sexual relationships, in what area of life is illusion most prevalent? It's in the area of the sexual relationship. You know, this is where we, we delude ourselves more than any other area of life. Because we have perfect clarity when it comes to business or when it comes to nutrition, but when it comes to intimate relationships, this is where we routinely fool ourselves. You know, something which is physically beautiful becomes, in our warped sense of values, something which is good for us, something that will enrich us, something that will make our lives better. And we fall into this trap and uh, the consequences are uh, often very, very painful. If Midian's mission, so to speak, is to seduce the Jewish people, that means they stand, they symbolize the idea of illusion. Well, how do you combat illusion? You combat illusion with facts, with knowledge. The from Moshe Rabbeinu is the antithesis of Midian. As long as there's Midian in the world, you need Moshe Rabbeinu. As long as there's Dimion, as long as there's fantasy. To counteract fantasy, you need Moshe Rabbeinu, who's that. It says, if we can get rid of Midian, then we can survive without Moshe Rabbeinu. Because we'll have enough clarity to make our own decisions. You don't need Moshe Rabbeinu to keep reminding us of what the reality is. So this is a remnant. Wage war against Midian? And then you can die. Meaning, as long as there is Midian and what Midian represents, then you need Moshe Rabbeinu. It says if you can get rid of Midian, then you can survive on your own, even without Moshe Rabbeinu. That's the, the Rema, is the, the Ishbitzi says in this passage. And it's really true. You think about it for a second. But a person who has a tendency to fantasizing, to living in a world of illusion, needs someone who's going to tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, buddy, listen, <laughs> you're making a big mistake. That's not the way it is. See things as they really are, etc. If a person could rid himself of this temptation to live in a fantasy world, then uh, he has half a chance of survival on his own. And that really is, is the evidence. And the, that really is what we're talking about. We live in a fantasy world, and that is the root of all our sorrows is if we can shatter those illusions, then we'll begin to live the right way, and hopefully we can bring the gula on. Now, Chazal tell us that the, the cause of the destruction of the second base of English, which of course is really the loss that we lament the most, because the first base of English was to a certain extent restored, not completely, there were certain things that were never brought back. The Gemara Yuma says there were five things that were not restored with the rebuilding of the second base of Mignish, but to a certain extent it was. The second base of Mignish, of course, was not restored at all. So really, our focus is more on the destruction of the Bayashani. And the Gemara says that the sin that brought the destruction of the Bayashani is the sin of sin as you know, the sin of gratuitous hatred. Jews can't get along. Jews just can't get along. And as a result, Corbin comes. And we've said many times the morale, the morale explains, because one of the very important functions of the Beis HaMikdash is to foster Jewish unity. Now, this is the rallying point. This is the point to which we all turn in prayer. This is the point to which we gather three times a year. Shalosh Pavan Bashana, Yehuelakos Chorecha, all people gather to the Beis HaMikdash. So this is the unifying element of Kral Yisrael. That's its function. So, uh, Maral says the rule of thumb is like this. If you're given a gift, if you use it, you're allowed to keep it. You don't use it, it's taken away. So if you allow the Beis Migdash to unify the nation, you're allowed to keep the gift of the Beis Migdash. If you don't allow it to do its purpose, because Sinas Chinam is rampant, so it's taken away. That's the explanation of the Gemara. So we're talking about Jewish unity. And 
taking away division. Now, this is a very, very complex thing. This is a very complex thing. There was once in world history an attempt to create unity, which was, of course, the Migdal Bava, the Tower of Babel. And it's very, very interesting. In Sifri Hasidus, there is a contrast which is made between the Migdal Bava and the Basin Migdash. Was what the base of Migdash is in Kiddusha, the Migdal Bavel is in Tum. The Chazal tell us, the Zel Umazel, I said, look, everything has a counterpart. You know, uh, you know there are there are Eser Spheros, there are ten holy attributes of God. The Mukubalim tell us there are also Kisri in the Mesa there are crowns of impurity, there are crowns of Tum. There was parallel to the ten holy spheros, there are crowns of impurity. Because everything is zelumaset, everything has a correspondence. Everything in Kedusha, in holiness, has something which corresponds to it in Tumah. So Sifri Hasidus, it says that the Migdal Babel, the Tower of Babel, corresponds to the base of Migdash. Well, the base of Migdash is in Kedusha, the Migdal Babel is in Tumah. And the Gemara says an amazing thing. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin that Avir Migdal Mashkach. It was an amazing thing. If you walked by the ruin of the Migdal Babo, I don't know if you walked by, you walked over, it would cause you to forget. Because all the things that were important to remember would be erased from your memory if you passed by the vicinity of the Migdal Bob. In other words, the base of Migdash reinforces the holy things we should know. The Migdal Bob has the power to cause a person to forget. It's an amazing thing. But the Migdal Bob was also rooted in an attempt to create unity. What did the Psukum tell us? The Psukum tell us that they said, let's make a city and the tower which reaches heaven, the Nasalon Hushain, and let us make a name for ourselves, Penotus of Neha Adam, let us be scattered over the face of the earth. So they set themselves to the task of building a city and a tower reaching heaven. God comes down to look at the tower, and he says that there's a tremendous spirit of unity, I see. And this is what they've decided to do. So God says this, I have to frustrate. And God, of course, confounded the languages, and the entire project lapsed. What was wrong? What was the Aveir? Sounds like a commendable thing. Achtos, unity. So the Ramban says an amazing thing. The Ramban says that right fei hapshat, people that pursue the, the simple meaning give the following explanation. Now, it's interesting to note that there are many fanciful explanations what they were trying to do. There's even one explanation, and you'll hear it, this, that they were trying to build a launch pad for a ship that could travel to the moon. Because they figured very, very wisely that what if there'd be another flood? Where could we escape to? But if we have a launch pad on which we can send the ship to the moon, so if worst comes to worst, and there's a flood of people know them. <laughs> I mean, many fanciful explanations. The Ramban says that right for Pshat, people who pursue Pshat, say the following explanation. They say that God wanted that the world should be diversified. God wanted that people should spread over the face of the earth. They should populate the entire world. They should become differentiated by languages. It was part of the divine plan. It wasn't as you would think that if not for this sin, everyone would still be speaking one language. God wanted the world to become diversified, and people should spread, and people should have different cultures and different ways of life. It would have taken a lot longer for it to happen. But since human beings try to frustrate God's plan, 
And they said, no, let's build a city and a tower and let the entire human race live in close proximity and share language, values, beliefs, etc. So they tried to undermine God's plan. So God had to intervene in order to ensure that that God's plan will win out in any case. And therefore, what he did was, is he confounded the languages. That's what the Ramban says. So it's an interesting thing. No, Achtos is a nice thing. But Achtos doesn't mean bathing in the same water. It doesn't mean sharing a toothbrush. It doesn't mean we do the exact same thing. In other words, Achtos means that, yes, we are diversified. We form distinct communities with different languages, different lifestyles, yet we have something in common. We share something in common. Because in Yerushalayim, it wasn't like in Babel. In Babel, the idea was that everyone should live around the Migdal. In Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim, Shavosh Pavel Nashana. Three times a year you get together. There's no ideal that everyone live in proximity to the base of Mignesh. You have to live different lives. These will live by the shore, the seashore, and they'll have a seafaring existence. And these people will be farmers, and these people will be miners, and all sorts of professions, and all sorts of cultures and values. All, of course, shaped and informed by Torah values. And therefore, three times a year, you'll have a convention. You'll gather in Yerushalayim, you'll receive encouragement, chizuk, inspiration. Then you'll go back to your cities, to your farms, to your places, and you'll live very different lives. There's a tremendous balance. And that was the issue that they got wrong in Bavel, and we're meant to get right in Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim. Right? In Bavel, there was this attempt to create such a unity where everyone was the same, everyone held the same thing, believed the same thing, spoke the same way. That's contrary to the Ratzon Hashem. God wants diversity. God wants uniqueness. He wants us to be differentiated. He wants us to realize our own potentials in accordance with our own temperaments, our own natures. But we join together from time to time in the base of Megdush and Yerushalayim. That's really the, the idea behind it all. I think that if you reflect upon this for a moment, you'll understand the connection between the end of last week's parsha and the beginning of this week's parsha, And it relates to these themes. As we've pointed out many times, that sometimes you have parshias that are juxtaposed, parshias that are placed next to each other, not because they express the same themes, but because they express opposite themes, and the truth is with the balance of two conflicting ideas. The end of last week's parsha, we have the parsha of Karbonos Tzibur. We have the parsha of the public communal sacrifices, the daily sacrifice, the carbon tamid, the carbon musaf, the additional sacrifice, Shabbos, Yontif, and so on and so forth. They give seat. We talked about this last week, and we explained that the whole idea of this parsha is the idea of Jewish unity. And uh, we, we mentioned the very beautiful Medrash, which says that when Moshe Rabbeinu went to Abedash Baruch and said, appoint a leader to succeed me, so Moshe Rabbeinu said, Yifkod alokei haruchos mechobasa, let God who is the master of all flesh, the master of all flesh, let him appoint a leader. So uh, Rashi points out that what was the one quality that Moshe Rabbeinu thought was necessary for his successor? A person who could understand every different person. He could understand every person where that person was at, with his own temperament, his own nature. And he could deliver and lead everybody effectively. Al-Qarad Baruch responds and gives the parsha of Korbonus. What's the, what's the connection? So the manager said like this, what was the marshal? Very beautiful marshal. There was once a 
king. And the king used to get angry at his wife from time to time. She made a mistake. She burnt the food, this, that. The king would get angry. And the king had a friend, he had a shushbit. And the shushbit used to calm the king down. He'd tell the king, don't get so excited. It's all right. Forgive her. And then one day the shushbit is diagnosed with a terrible illness. The shushbit discovers he's dying. So he goes to the friend of the king and says, listen, you know, I'm not going to be here forever. And I know you fly off the handle. So I'm telling you now, listen, be nice to your wife. If she'll make mistakes, forgive her. And so on and so forth. So the king says to the shushbin, instead of telling me I should forgive her for making mistakes, tell her not to make mistakes. <laughs> and talk to her. We'll solve the problem in a more fundamental way. In other words, telling me to be more forgiving is a band-aid solution. Well, she'll make mistakes, she'll burn the dinner, but I'm going to forgive her. Solve the problem in a more fundamental way by uh, straightening out, instructing her how to run the household, not to make mistakes. So it's the same thing. Moshe Rabbeinu says that uh, we have a nation which is so diverse, so many different ways of thinking, ways of living. He says we need a leader who can relate to all sorts of different people. <laughs> I remember, you know, it's funny uh, why these thoughts fall into my head, but many, many years ago, by now it must be almost 35 years ago. I had an older friend who applied for a rabbinic position in a shul. And uh, he was a very, very big Talmud Chacham, but he was a little naive about the ways of the world. Anyway, he comes back from his uh, trial, his proba, you know, the trial, Shabbos, and I asked him, so how did it go? He said, well, it went well. No, his performance was very good. But he doesn't think he's interested in the position. So I say, why not? So he says, you know, I heard that in that shul, there are some people who are only interested in making money. I said, really? No, don't, don't tell me. <laughs> really? There are such people. In other words, this was a person, his whole life was was Torah and Mitzvah, Slavita Hashem. He assumed that everyone must be that way. But someone told him that in that shul there were people who were only just to make money. Like he, he found it hard to believe, certainly hard to relate to. So you, know, you have Moshe Rabbeinu, he's come to understand that there are all sorts of people in Klai so Yes, there are people interested in Torah, there are people interested in money, there are people interested in sports, all sorts of things. You need a leader that can talk to the sportsmen about sports and the money makers about money and uh, can give a sheer to the people who want tire. See, it's a tall order. So you have to appoint someone who can deal with everybody, can relate to everybody. So to that, I remember who said, instead of finding a leader who can relate to everybody, why don't we try to solve the problem in a more fundamental way and get everyone thinking along the same lines? And that's the idea of carbonist seaboard, the idea that the community as a whole should be involved and engaged in Avaita Sashem, carbonist, and that will solve the problem in a more fundamental way. But the truth is it's more complex than that. Because as we said, Jewish unity does not mean that we are meant to be clones of one another. And yes, we share values, but on the other hand, there also is a reality of being a nation which is comprised of differing groups of people. Comes our Parsha. Our Parsha, the beginning of our Parsha is a very mysterious Parsha. What it has to do with Sefer Bimidbar is a mystery. Most of who calls the Rashi on Matos, he calls the heads of the tribes, and he gives them a Parsha which discusses the laws of Nidorim, the laws of vows. If a person makes a vow, a neder, or a shavua, or an oath. So he's obligated to keep it, and uh, under most circumstances, there's very little he can do, except in the case of a wife who made a vow. Her husband can veto the vow, it's called hafara, or in the case of a young daughter, the father can do the same. So uh, 
It's a very, very technical parsha of vows. Now, we know that these parshias, Pinchas, Matos, Masse, bring us to the threshold of Eretz Yisrael. Many of the subjects discussed are the borders of Eretz Yisrael, the division of Eretz Yisrael, the tribes that wanted their portion on the east side of the Jordan, the establishment of the Ari Mitla, the cities of refuge in Eretz Yisrael. Now, these parshias, the census, which is a prelude to the apportionment, these parshas deal with the entry into Eretz Yisrael. Even the Korbanas, we spoke about the Ramban, the Ramban says the Korbanas only were brought in Eretz Yisrael, they weren't brought in the Midbar. So we're at the threshold of Eretz Yisrael. Why are the laws of vows just placed here? It's a very important thing. You know, we have, we have 613 instances which bind us, and in a sense, they guide us in everything we do. Why do we need a vehicle for making more prohibitions in ourselves, or more commandments in ourselves? But that's essentially what a neder or a shvua does. A neder creates new prohibitions. A shvua creates new obligations. I don't have enough obligations. I don't, don't have enough prohibitions. Does the Torah have to give me a method by which I can create new obligations and new prohibitions? In other words, in case 613 mitzvahs aren't enough and you need more, <laughs> here's a method. You can use Nidarim, you can use Shavuos, and you can create new obligations and new mitzvahs, new Yisurim. But it should be enough. The answer is like this. Chazal tell us, Asu siyog You should make fences around the Torah. In other words, you have 630 mitzvahs, but uh, it's easy to trip and violate them. So we have to build fences. These are the gzeros, these are the decrees which the Chazal made to uphold the Torah. So, for example, when it comes to Shabbos, let's say, there are 39 basic categories of forbidden labor. But it's very easy to violate one of the 39. It's very easy to be tempted. So sometimes the Chazal had to make a gzera decree to ensure that we would not be tempted. So for example, one of the prohibitions is writing. Writing. The reason you can't do business in a shop is buying and selling is only a rabbinic decree because you might come to write. And you think about it for a second that every business involves some form of record keeping, receipts, or bills. So if you could run your business, buy and sell, you'd be tempted to write, which of course is prohibited labor. So the Chazal forbade operating a business, buying and selling, because you might come to write. It's a necessary decree. The prohibition of writing would not be upheld unless there was a prohibition of doing business. So that's an example of a rabbinic decree. That's a decree which the Chazal made for the entire Jewish nation. Right? This isn't something which is local. This isn't something which only uh, the people in this city or this province observe. These were gezeras, these were decrees that were made by the based in Hagoro, by the Supreme Court, for all of Klal Yisrael. But when Chazal say, Asusiyot Matera, they're not only speaking to the nation as a whole. They're also speaking to individuals. They're speaking to specific groups and even individual people. So the question the Mesilas Yisharim asks is that why don't we assume that the Chazal made all the necessary gzeras? And if there's a need for a decree to uphold the Torah, to guarantee the Torah not be violated, the Chazal would have made that. What's the point of making personal siyogim? The Mesilas Yisharim gives an answer. But I think the answer is much more fundamental. The answer is very, very simple. Every person finds himself in a unique set of circumstances. A unique family situation, a unique place, a unique time, the historical period, and so on and so forth. And therefore, my temptations are not the same as your temptations, which are not the same as her temptations, not the same as his temptations. Because every person is susceptible 
to temptation of a different sort. And therefore, there may be a specific siyog, a specific fence, which you don't need by any desperately. And therefore, every individual has to make fences which are appropriate for himself. Those fences which Klal Yisrael deemed as being necessary for the majority of people, or perhaps for all people, those the Chazal legislated for all people. But everyone knowing his own situation, and his own Yitzhahara, and his own temptations, and his own desires, understands that for himself, there have to be certain additional fences. And it wouldn't make sense that Chazal should make those fences. Because these aren't fences that everyone needs. These are fences that you need, or that I need, as an individual. It's because, perhaps, of the career that I pursue, or the particular place that I live, or the relationships I have with <coughs> certain people. There are special shiogim, special fences, that I need to make. And the Gemara says that nidarim shiog lepricious that vows are the fence for these fences, so to speak. Because if you're going to make a siyad for yourself, how are you going to uphold it? You uphold it by nidarim. Nidarim, vows, and shavuos are the ways of, in a sense, customizing the Torah to your unique situation. Right? How do you give teeth to the fences you make for yourself? By making them obligatory upon you with the vehicle of Nidarim and Shmuz, bows and oaths. That's the purpose of this, of this parsha. It's an amazing thing, you think about it, right? The Yubanishkan gave us a way to, in a sense, customize our religious observance. But to give it not the power of a New Year's resolution, which means nothing, but to give it the power of something which is binding in Torah law itself. So if I see I have a weakness, for um, overeating. So I might make a vow that prohibits eating certain things, eating certain times, etc., etc., etc. That vow has power under Torah law. If I violate the vow, I'm liable for lashes under Torah law. So at the same time that it's something which is part of Torah, it's something which is very, very personal, and it's a way of dealing with my own uh, issues in an effective way. This was not so necessary in the Midbar. When the Jews were in the Midbar, their life was essentially a shared experience. Everyone ate the same thing. Everyone drank the same thing. Everyone lived in proximity to the Mishkan. Nobody worked. <laughs> right? So life was a shared experience. So if there was a need to make a siyog, Moshe Rabbeinu would have made it for everybody. And Chazal tell us there were gazeras, there were decrees that Moshe Rabbeinu made for Klal Yisrael. And if it wasn't necessary for the entire Klal Yisrael, it probably wasn't necessary for any individual either. But as the Jews are standing at the threshold of Eretz Yisrael, and now they're going to go in their different directions, and this shevet will live here, and this shevet will live there, and each person will pursue his own career. So now we have to introduce the vehicle of Nidarium to enable everybody to customize his religious practice to deal with the personal issues he has to deal with. And this is why it's very interesting that Moshe Rabbeinu gives this mitzvah to the Rashi Hamatas, to the heads of the tribes. Now this is something unusual. Because we often have Moshe Rabbeinu speaking to call Adas B'nai Yisrael. He speaks to all of Klal Yisrael as a group, as a single undifferentiated group. But the idea of speaking to the heads of tribes seems to imply the idea of representation. In other words, he's speaking to the 12 tribes as 12 tribes through their representatives, the Rashi Amatas, the heads of the tribes come. So here we're not talking about speaking to all of Klal Yisrael, right? When Moshe Rabbeinu does that, either he speaks directly to all the people or he speaks to the Zikne Yisrael, who will in turn transmit it to the people. 
You don't find Rashi Amatas. Rashi Amatas, the heads of tribes, is because here we're speaking to each tribe as an individual tribe through the representative of the head of the tribe. And the idea is, 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 is as we said, because each tribe is going to have its own unique role to play. Each tribe has its own temperament, its nature, its mission. It's going to live in a unique geographic setting. And therefore, the nidarim that this tribe would make are not the nidarim that that tribe would make, which are not the nidarim that the next tribe would make. And therefore, this Rashi Hamatas. The, the parsha is given to the heads of tribes as representatives of their respective tribes. But it comes out that this first parsha of nidarim is really a contrast for last week's parsha, which concluded Parsha's Pinchas. The parsha of Korbanas Sibur is the idea of Jewish unity. Right? The entire nation joins in the bringing of Korbanas. The idea of Nidarim is the vehicle for differentiation, differentiation of tribes, and ultimately differentiation of individuals. It's the exact opposite. What is the truth? The truth is somewhere in between. And when I say it's somewhere in between, I don't mean <coughs> split the difference. I mean, there's a balance of different considerations, and in some situations, the one will outweigh the other, and in other situations, the other will outweigh the one. Because on the one hand, there's an ideal of Jewish unity, as represented in the Korbanas Sibur. On the other hand, there is this idea of differentiation, the recognition that we're all different, and that our lifestyles are different, and our values are different, and therefore, of necessity, our Avodah Hashem will be different, and that requires the customization which Nadarim can provide. And that really is the challenge of Jewish unity. Now, Jewish unity is not everyone doing the same thing. That's the Migdal Baba, and we know that failure. Jewish unity is, on the one hand, everyone living a unique existence, but on the other hand, everyone's sharing in the common values of Torah. So we have the balance between the parsha of Korbanas Sibur, which ended last week's parsha, which is the idea of, of total unity, and the idea of Nidarim, which is the idea of total individuality. And the correct balance is sometimes the one, sometimes the other. And that's why these two parshas are juxtaposed, not because they both convey the same idea, but because they both convey complementary ideas, and finding the correct balance is going to be the real challenge. And that really is the challenge that we face when we try to tackle the problem of Simaschina. We try to tra tackle this problem of, of Jews getting along with one another. This is really the question. To what extent do we want or consider desirable that Jews should share common beliefs, and to what extent is it desirable that Jews diversify? A lot of the sinas chinam really is a consequence of this uh, the problem, because people assume that if uh, I live this way, and I think this way, and I dress this way, and I eat this way, why don't you do the same? Now, there's a remez, my uh, Chazal, Chazal say about people the same with their faces aren't alike, the ways of thinking aren't alike. So someone once said, an amazing interpretation said like this, let's say, I go to a person and say, you know, I'm so handsome. Why don't you look like me? Like, why do you choose to look like you look? I mean, if you look like me, wouldn't you be happier? Wouldn't you be better? So why don't you look like me? There's no one ever say a thing like that, right? We don't understand that everyone is meant to look different. Right? You don't, wouldn't want two people to look exactly the same. So why do we accept people should think the same? Whereas if, if we're willing to accept the fact that everyone looks different, why can't we accept the idea that people think differently? No, when it comes to thinking, everyone has to think like I think. It's not true. Just like faces aren't the same, and there's nothing wrong with that. So people think, we also be different. There's nothing wrong with that. Diversity is not something to be tolerated. It is something to be cherished. But that diversity has to be rooted in terror. 
And that's the balance of Parshas Pinchas and Parshas Matos. This Parshas Matos is the parish where Moshe speaks to the Rashi of Matos, where the tribes are going to become differentiated, where the tribes are going to become different, where individuals within the tribes will become different, and therefore they're given the means for customizing their unique approaches to Avodah Hashem. And on the other hand, Parshas Pinchas, which is the ideal of Korbanas Siva, which is perfect unity. The correct balance, that's the challenge to find, and that, of course, is the challenge of the tikkun of the problem of sin asin. If we could find this perfect balance, then we go a long way to settling the differences which divide us and which, of course, bring korban, prevent the restoration of the base of English. If we could address the issues that these parashiyas address, then we'll be a step closer to Gula and Mashiach coming.